So I want to talk about uh, the discussion around autism, developmental disorders, and matters related to consent and personal freedom, uh, informed consent and personal freedom. And the two things I want to stress out front, one, this is all being done in relation to the recent discussion around the arrest of Chris Chan. I, uh, Chris Chan currently identifies as female, as a transgendered female. Please understand, I have principled reasons uh, why I do not feel that it is appropriate to discuss uh, uh, Chris Chan in the context of being female, using female pronouns, and that kind of thing. If you want to hear more about what those reasons are, uh, watch the first video in this, I guess, series now, we'll call it, which was um, called We Need to Talk About Chris Chan. And um, the, uh, those reasons, all of those reasons aside, however, rest assured that if I were in Chris Chan's presence, uh, speaking to them or in their or speaking in their presence, I would say uh, I would use female pronouns and call Chris Christine. Uh, that's just a basic uh, human courtesy, and so I and I bring that up to point out that I'm in no way trying to uh, ruffle the feathers of the actual trans community. The other uh, observation that I and the, the deep my deeper reasons for that are discussed in that first video called "We Need to uh, Talk About Chris Chan." The other thing to point out uh, for newcomers is that I myself am autistic, so all of these discussions that I'm having about autism, about the community, about how it's discussed. Uh, all of that, this is very much me critiquing from within. So <clears throat> anyway, one of the big questions that has come up a lot in, um, the, one of the questions that's come up so much in um, this discussion that I've been having, uh, talking about Chris Chan, talking about the actions of Isabella Janke, who may have been motivating him to uh, commit the heinous acts in question, um, one of the subjects that keeps coming up is people asking, you know, how is it fair or to, how is it fair to say certain individuals can't give meaningful consent or where do we draw the line, that kind of thing. A good example of this comes from a comment, this is a regular commenter to my channel, uh, someone named Kato Kuhn who writes, um, while it is true that, while it's true that developmentally disabled people can't understand the risks of, se of the sexual relationships they're entering into, they are still adults with an adult sex drive. Telling them that they shouldn't be able to do things that they want to do seems kind of cruel. It's also hard to know where the cutoff as too disabled for sex is. You and I are both autistic. The guy you described, by the way, when I say the guy you described, I was talking in the earlier videos about a Chris Chan-like individual that I encountered in my life a few years ago. And no, it's not anybody you would have heard of, and uh, it's somebody that I'm taking great pains not to identify because I don't want to cause any problems for them. Uh, but anyway, the guy you describe is high functioning compared to most. Only 30% of high IQ autistic people even have a part-time job. You're obvious, you've obviously had trouble knowing who to get involved with. I've had similar less, pu uh, similar, less public, of course, problems in that area. So who is to say we wouldn't be considered too disabled for sex if we go down this rabbit hole? Obviously, we're less disabled than they are, but it's hard to know where, but it's hard to know where to draw the line. Something similar applies to the maybe these persons shouldn't be on the internet thing you said in the previous video. Okay, so with the, when it talks when I talk about developmentally disabled people and internet access, I'm ultimately talking about having a very highly highly monitored internet access, uh, and and I think in some cases individuals should not have access to things like um, you know internet fandoms and forum communities and that kind of thing where they don't they. Uh, where they can potentially meet people that can uh, manipulate them or coerce them in some way. Um, that needs to be either closed off or highly, highly monitored de depending on their um, their level of uh, mental health issues. Um, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't think if I, if I suggested this, or uh, I don't think I said this, if I did, I said it without fully considering the implications. But I'm not suggesting that they have no internet access at all, because obviously they, um, obviously they would, uh, you know, using the internet is a fairly necessary part of uh, the human experience in any civilized society. Now it's a necessity. So 
uh, they they will need it. You know, a, a um, the, the the same uh, the same person who uh, should not have uh, access to fan forums. You know, will probably still need to. Uh, hire, you know, hail an Uber to get to work and that kind of thing. I'm not saying they shouldn't have that kind of access. Anyway, <clears throat> talking about where to draw the line. So I actually did a lot of um, reading about this. And if I can go back and find some examples of what I'm talking about, I'll plug them in in the bottom. But one of the crucial questions in determining whether or not someone is capable of giving meaningful consent comes down to whether or not they are not only capable of understanding the wrongness of their actions, what they did, that uh, made, what, why they made a mistake, how they were affected by it, but understanding how not to, you know, how to benefit from that experience, how to not get into that same situation again. Uh, and so, and that's not to say that people won't get into the same uh the same situation again. It's determining whether or not they have the capacity to not get in the same situation again. Think of it this way, like, you know, a fairly common narrative that we hear is the woman who goes to, uh, you know, it keeps getting into abusive relationships with abusive men and finding herself at domestic violence centers and that kind of thing. And she eventually gets into some kind of therapy and they break down the cycle of abuse and start examining why she's bringing these people into her life. And they're ultimately able to find out that maybe, you know, she's trying to, uh, she's trying to, um, you know, fix these abusive men because she's trying to fix, you know, something that had to do with her father or something like that. And that's a fairly common example of people when people get into abusive relationships. Okay, she may understand it, she can learn that comprehend that, understand the meaning and the implications of it, and still potentially go back and get into more abusive relationships. The question is, can she cognitively understand the knowledge that she needs to gain to get out of that abusive relationship cycle? That's the kind of thing that we're talking about. In the case of the uh, person we both know, uh, I, you know, you and I both know who you're referring to when we talk about my poor judgment and getting involved with people, that choice of getting involved with that person has come to define the person that I am going forward. Like thinking for the last uh, almost seven years now, I have been deeply, deeply devoted to the question of, you know, what did I, questions like, what did I not see coming in that individual? What did I, uh, you know, what do I need to do to make sure that I don't encounter that sort of thing again? Uh, you know, build, rebuilding my sense of self, knowing that I was a victim, that I was victimized by that person. That's critical. I know that that person victimized me. And I understand that I was victimized by that person. Uh, people who have diminished capacity very often don't understand that they're being, uh, they're being uh, mistreated and taken advantage of. They don't uh, have the long-term uh, insight and ability to plan out a course of action for their lives to ensure that they don't get in those situations again. Again, it's not saying that they won't ever get in those situations again. It's saying, can they ta understand and take action against it? That's the question. Do they have the capacity for that? Not whether or not they do. So, um, in, in regards to, you know, in regards to Chris Chan, asking if Chris Chan has the ability to give uh, informed consent. Well, if you, you like I, have probably followed uh, Chris Chan to some degree for as long as he's been on the internet. And you will recall that one of the early trolling efforts against Chris Chan was to convince him that Shigeru Miyamoto wanted to meet with him to discuss making a Sonichu video game. Uh, now, um, even you know, even I, as a uh, as being high functioning autistic myself, if someone came to me with that, I would have a tremendous amount of skepticism. With someone, I'll give you an example. For a while, I don't have this partnership agreement anymore because my subscriber numbers went down. I used to have about I think about ten thousand, and it dropped down a few uh, to where it is now, which is like seven something. But anyway, during that time, I uh, entered into a um, 
a an advertising partnership deal with this one specific um, advertising group that was doing a, a project with uh, YouTube uh, YouTube bloggers and YouTube influencers where they were saying, you know, we, we're giving you access to all of these high-level tools uh, in exchange for a cut of the advertising money and everything. I entered into that. It was a great, it was a great deal, by the way. I, uh, I'm, you know, I made some money off of it and uh, don't have any regrets about it. But when I was messaged about that, I, uh, I got that message. I, um, contact, I wrote back to the guy and I said, well, I'm very interested in doing, I'm certainly very interested in doing this. This sounds positive. Do you mind if we sit down uh, on Skype and talk about it face to face? And we sat down on Skype face to face, said no problem. We sat down face to face. He was in his office. We sat there at the company. We sat there and talked. He showed me his credentials, all of that. And I thanked him. And he was totally understanding that I wanted that assurance and that peace of mind. Chris Chan just gets a message in the mail. A, a, you know, gets a, me a letter in the mail from somebody saying, hi, we're from Nintendo, and she, or in the email in this case, you know, hi, we're from Nintendo, and Shigeru Miyamoto wants to make your game, uh, wants to make your character into a game, and he immediately goes running to his, um, goes running to his internet and reports this wonderful, joyous news, because he has no capacity to determine the legitimacy of this. All he knows is if you get something with Nintendo letterhead on it, oh my god, it must, you know, he thinks, oh my god, it must be real. It's the, the same, the same gullibility that led him to think that he was legitimately in a relationship with Vanessa Hudgens, the actress. <clears throat> Again, someone with even a slight amount of self-awareness, a slight amount of cognitive, uh, rational capacity should be able to understand that, you know, one, I mean, Chris Chan is obviously no prize physical specimen, but even if he were, it's highly, 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 highly unlikely that a major Hollywood actress would randomly contact someone out of no, you know, all of these things are completely beyond Chris. All he understands is that somebody told him this and he thinks it, so he thinks it's true. So much so that one of the things, one of the recent uh, video clips that has come out in the um, the purge of all of, or the the um, uh, the the what what is touted as being an online purge of Isabella Janke's um, uh, collection of personal collection of information about Chris, one of the things that's come out in that is a video uh, that somebody made where they are screen testing. Uh, they they have they're they're videotaping Chris Chan. They're in the room with him, and they're having him pose um, under the with the understanding that they are screen testing him for a Sonichu movie. And they're talking about you know CGI you know CGI Rose Chu and all of this stuff and how to represent her and how and all this. So he thinks somebody convinced Chris Chan that they want to make a Sonichu movie. He has not learned at all, at all, that these people are just continually pulling his leg, continually jerking him around. Almost 20 years of being jerked around this way, he has no capacity to understand, or no, no, no ability to be even slightly suspicious of these people. And so that is somebody who cannot, who lacks, has d demonstrates over time that he lacks the ability to uh, understand, uh, to understand the reality of his situation, he can't understand that he's being taken advantage of. You know, I understand in that situation you describe. I understand that I was being taken advantage of. I understand that I was being abused. I didn't understand it at the time. It took me a long time to comprehend it, to come around to the idea. Because when you're being abused, the first thing you do is start denying it. Uh, when you're being, when you're confronted on it, the first thing you do is start denying it, and um, and so I it took me a long time to get to that point, but I understand what was happening so so well that my understanding of that situation has allowed me to get allowed me to get other less um, other less uh, potent toxic people out of my life that I was dealing with, realizing toxic, understanding toxic behaviors when I came across them. So that, uh, that is an example of 
where Chris Chan lacks the cognitive ability to understand what's happening to him. It's not that he is uh, prone to human error, as we all are. It's that he's incapable of understanding. And this is very, very important. Um, that ability to understand the nature of one's actions and the responsibility for one's actions, this is actually crucial in the justice system, which is what we're now dealing with. You know, Ron White... Um, the comedian uh, is from Texas, and in one of his comedy routines, he jokes about how there's a guy on death row in Texas that was scheduled to be executed, and then, uh, to use his terminology, uh, a bunch of people intervened on that guy's behalf to say that he was too crazy to know that he was being executed. Well, Ron White's playing that for laughs, and I would imagine on some level he understands that uh, he understands the reality of the situation, which is that. In, this, in our society, in our civilized society, we do not, in, as policy, we do not enact cruel and unusual punishment. Now, I'm opposed to the death penalty, period. I don't believe in the death penalty for any reason unless it's, a, it's something like an active shooter situation where they have to nullify the, there's an immediate threat that has to be nullified. But um, the, uh, in, the case of, um, in, in the case of death row inmates, I don't support it at all. Uh, but anyway... That, that actually, he's making fun of it, but that's actually a very important and very legitimate criteria in the, in the pursuit of not enacting cruel and unusual punishment. People, because of that, people who are punished have to be able to understand why they are being punished, um, why, uh, not only why what they did was wrong, but why they are being punished for what they did. They have to be able to understand that period. Um, if they don't, if they don't, it, it is a legitimately cruel thing to do. Uh, because as far as they know, they're being, as, as far as they know, they're being punished for no reason, and that becomes torture. And we don't, as policy, we don't torture people. So uh, this is, these are crucial questions to ask. And another example that no one seems to be talking about is in terms of capacity to consent is Barbara Chandler. Now, you notice when Chris Chan was arrested, he was not arrested on charges of rape. He was arrested on charges of incest. That is because Barbara Chandler's capacity to give informed consent will now be called into question. She, uh, she is probably currently being examined for that exact reason. And they're supposed to, he's supposed to appear in court again, I believe, in, on September 16th. That is if... <clears throat> If they determine that she was not capable of giving informed consent, that is when the rape charge will likely be handed down, I would think. But um, he, you know, whether or not she consented is important, and it's also important because if Barbara Chandler is found to be of sound mind, she is now uh, open to being charged with incest, subject to being charged with incest. So that uh, these are crucial questions. With regards to the person that I uh, mentioned earlier, um, the, the Chris Chan-like individual that I encountered in my own life, uh, you pointed out, you talked about him having, um, you said that he's high-functioning high compared to most. Trust me, he's not. Like I mentioned, I, I probably shouldn't have mentioned that he had that job because that, um, <clears throat> we're, ta we're not talking about we're, we're I don't want to go. I don't want to say anything that could identify, could be used to identify him. But like, it's it, it, it's not. Um, it, it, it's it's. I, I hate to say it this way, but it's borderline something. It was a job. The responsibility of that job was pretty much something that a trained monkey could do. I mean, there it was. It was a very very much a, a just a the simple kind of thing that you give to um, to minimally functioning people to give them some kind of you know productive activity it was not it, it was not any kind of indication of a capacity for personal responsibility or anything like that at all um, and and also I don't know to what extent that person was able to do that job well I don't know how well they were performing at that job I don't mean any disrespect with the uh, trained monkey. Uh, comment, but it really is like it really was on that level. 
Uh, the other thing talking now, the, the last thing I want to bring up is you talk about, you say there's still adults with an adult sex drive, but you left out something very important. We're talking about adults with an adult sex drive who have the minds of children. That is crucial. And you're asking me why I would do, you know, why I would call, call their capacity to be involved in these things into question. Well, oh my God, it's because we are now talking about a severely mentally disabled person that is uh, about to go on trial for raping his mother. It's because of things like that. And I promise you, when they, if they take, if they, if they charge him with raping Barb Chandler, and it's very likely that they will, I promise you that one of the questions, and even if he's only charged with incest, one of the questions that is going to be crucial in that discussion is going to be was he capable of is he capable of understanding why what he did was wrong he definitely understands that people think that it's wrong that people don't approve of it but can he understand why it's wrong and that mind of a child thing is so important because think about it it's the diff if a child let's say that a child is approached by a uh, an adult man in a car that they don't know, and the adult man says, if you get in the car, I'll take you somewhere where I'll give you lots of candy, and the child gets in the car and does it. This is, if, if uh, you know, if a fully grown adult makes that decision, uh, even if a fully grown adult makes that decision, it can still be considered kidnapping. But, if a child makes that decision, it is definitely kidnapping because the ch we know that the child does not have the cognitive capacity to weigh all of the potential dangers of that situation. Um, and so that's the question we're talking about with the mind of a child. There's a documentary that I saw, I believe it was on Netflix, called Are All Men Pedophiles? And I want to be very clear, the ultimate conclusion, the, the, the documentary ended on a very ambiguous note where it sounded like, they ended, the last thing you hear is someone saying uh, that age is only a number. That is very, very, that left a very bad feeling with me because it, try, it made it sound like they were trying to make the implication uh, or they were trying to imply that, you know, um, that it, that it was in some way or shape, shape or form acceptable. I don't know if that's what, what they were suggesting or not, but it left a very bad taste in my mouth. However, there was a, throughout the documentary, the, uh, the gold among the lead and all of that was that, uh, or the diamond in the rough, was there a very thorough explanation of pedophile psychology. And they pointed out that, you know, pedophilia, or child molestation, ultimately breaks down into two categories. One is going to be the people who uh, are setting out with the intention of harming a child. Like they consciously know what they're doing and they understand why it's wrong and they're doing it with the intention of harming a child. It's like the, um, the tool, you know, it's usually they're doing it in response to some kind of trauma they endured, you know. So it's kind of like the, the tool song, Prison Sex, where he's saying, do unto me what has been done to me that kind of thing. It's usually something associated with that. They're trying to victimize somebody with the uh, conscious intention of getting on top of the situation that's going on in their mind psychodramatically. Then the other kind is what, what actually, the actual psychological process of a pedophile. A pedophile is someone with the mind of a child and an adult sex drive. And what they point out is as you mature, as you grow up, your sexual your sexual interests are going to generally align with your peer group so it's kind of like you know when you are you know when when you are entering puberty 12 13 14 that this range in here the most the most immediate targets of your sexual desire are going to be the you know the other people in your class people in your peer group that kind of thing and then as you get older, you know, you move into high school and it's people in that age range. You move into college age and it's pe naturally people in that age range. You enter into adulthood and it becomes people generally in that age range and up and up and up. Your, gen your strongest attractions are going to be, your primary attractions are going to be people in your peer group. Now granted, there's things like fantasizing about the hot teacher or the hot mom, that kind of thing. 
you know, the <clears throat> these fan those fantasy things exist primarily as fantasies. Most fantasies are not aspirational, uh, contrary to popular belief. But the people that you are legitimately motivated to have sexual encounters with are your immediate peer group, uh, you know, plus or minus a reasonable age within your, your immediate peer group. So a pedophile is somebody whose social and emotional development stops at an age that uh, stops at a very young age as their bodies and their sex drive continue to mature into adulthood. That's the re psychological reality of the people we're dealing with. And that is why we have to, that is why when we are dealing with the sex drive of a child, uh, the sex drive of an adult and the mind of a child, we have to be extremely careful. We're dealing with a whole other construct because you are talking, that's, um, the, you are talking about someone who is at that point very much, uh, very much a potential threat to children, and very much the potential victim of victimization in their own right. That's crucial. So, the um, uh, very much the target of victimization in their own right, and so that's where it comes. What it comes down to: these are very uncomfortable topics of discussion. That's I mean, they're very uncomfortable topics of discussion. That's why most people who are approaching the current discussion around Chris Chan are uh, doing it with humor. I understand that it's that you know humor is a coping mechanism, and um, I'm not. Pardon me. I'm not going to lie that there's a certain amount of humor that I've used to uh, to deflect the reality of this. Like I was joking with somebody the other day that at this point it totally would not surprise me if during the trial of Chris Chan, a portal opened into another dimension and a yellow Sonic the Hedgehog jumped out, grabbed Chris, and pulled him through the you know pulled him through and the void sealed behind them. You know, it's like. That I, I get the 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 absurdity of it all, and I get the need to make uh, you know the need to use humor as a tool of levity around it and a tool of coping. But it's unfortunately there are still these very serious discussions we need to have, and uh, hopefully this has contributed to that discussion in a positive way. Uh, so best wishes to everyone involved.